And we're back. Blast off. This is the great classic rock debate. I'm Kenny. I am Paul, and I have zero qualifications. And Steve is in Yellowstone. Yeah, we were go we're us. going to be Steveless tonight. He's not with us. And uh, I I have to say, I really miss him not being here, you know, because you and I a little older. So he gives us yeah, kind of a, a different older. angle on everything. Yeah. You know, I almost laughed. We were talking about, yeah, the first time I heard a uh, space oddity in 1973. And he said, yeah, the first time I heard it, I think was 89. <laughs> I know. <laughs> I go, it's so funny. Do you but, uh, that? Go ahead. I was well, say anyway, all I was going to say is we talk anything and everything classic rock. We try to keep it interesting and we try to have fun. If you're watching right now, please like comment and subscribe. Please feel free. Please leave comments in the comment section. We've been getting some great ones and I'm so appreciative. Really good comments. And I can tell comments based upon people who are watching the videos and, and engaged. So that's a good thing. Uh, tonight, we are going to talk about Boston. Boston released their debut album, self-titled, way back in 1976. And they were suddenly, and emphasis on the word suddenly, they were everywhere with their massive song more than a feeling okay now do you have you're a few years younger than i am yep. i would have been about 15 we both have late birthdays i would have been about 15 at that time do you remember were you old enough or whatever to remember when this was first happening no absolutely okay. not okay so i'll do Go the ahead. lead in and then uh and, and you can uh, uh chime in so this would have been Oh, I checked the release date. The album was released in August of 76, but I can tell you based upon my memory, it was fall. It was like September when suddenly we're hearing this song more than a feeling all over the radio. Okay. Now, before I get too far into the song itself, I want to sort of paint a picture of what the, you know, culturally what was going on at that time, especially in the music universe because you've heard me say it before the second half of the 70s was so dominated by disco disco music okay and even though disco gets a bad name there was a lot of great disco songs there were but there was totally so agree. much there was so much at that time i think that the record companies made a, a calculated decision they said you know it's so much cheaper to produce and to promote, you know, it's it's mostly studio creations. It's not, most most of the time you don't have elaborate bands making disco. It's mostly studio creations. Let me cheaper. Let me talk about what the, the music, although it was played on the radio, it, it was primarily originated as club music. Correct. And it went out from there and go on. Correct. And it was it was cheaper to produce. It was cheaper to promote. And because it sold so well. I believe that the record companies made a calculated decision to de-emphasize their investment in rock, okay? Rock didn't disappear. It didn't go away. You still had Led Zeppelin and Black Sabbath and the Rolling Stones and, and Deep Purple. You still had a, uh, Aerosmith. You still had a lot of rock bands that were out there making records. But I'm telling you, within the industry and within radio, the rock music was being de-emphasized while disco was being so heavily promoted along with what we now call soft rock. I'm telling you between disco and soft rock, these things were taking up all the airtime and there was, there was not a lot of good solid rock music being played on top 40 radio. Yes. I, I think we talked about this a long time ago. The, the bands, all those bands were go, going on their downward track. Right? Some certainly and, were. I mean, I mean, the Rolling Stones had an album called Sucking in the 70s. That was actually the name of the top of the album. Right. So, so um, Led Zeppelin was, all right, about this time, Presence was out. That's their last album until it's through the outdoor. Right. And Sabbath was doing their drugs, breaking up. Right. So Aerosmith was doing their drugs. So you had a dearth. Right. And I think on, on what you're saying, that that kind of went down. Fair enough. And disco it was a, and look, punk. it was a confluence of different things. Punk but came my point is the final result of all that was the the rock universe 
was receding at that time. Yes. No, 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 that's completely correct. Yes. And and so when Boston released this album and this hit single, it was mind boggling because number of different reasons. First of all, first and foremost, it is simply put, it is a great rock song. Okay. However, it's more than that. It's it's a melodic song. So it's easier on the ears for a person who's not, you know, heavily invested in hard rock. This song eases its way in. It's got the the softer verse followed by the booming chorus, right, where the song really rocks. So it's more accessible to the listener. And because this vocalist, Brad Delp, you know, we got to spend at least a couple of minutes talking about this guy, because his voice it, it will stop you in your tracks. It's so utterly amazing. Super this, talented singer, yeah. Yeah, this song, it just hit on all cylinders. And it was almost like a work of perfection in that moment. And if it had been released at a different time, it might not have had that same effect. But in this moment, when rock seemed to be, I don't want to use the word dying, but it was fading. Rock was fading. Boston, you know, I, the professor of rock, made a video about Boston and I don't, I don't think he titled it this, but he says the album that saved rock and roll. And I get, I get exactly what he was saying with that. And, and by the way, I say this all the time. If you've never watched professor of rock, go watch his videos. That guy's great. Okay. So is Rick Beato, uh, professor in rock, uh, rock and uh, Rick Beato, wonderful videos. Anyway. So, um, so the song is suddenly all over radio and I don't know anybody who doesn't like it. I mean, it's catchy. It's, it's another one of those where it's kind of hard to decipher all the lyrics. But uh, the lead vocalist, his name is Brad Delp, D-E-L-P. And what he can do with his voice is almost not human. Okay? Yeah, yeah. Now, we can easily sit down and make a long list of great rock vocalists. However... If we say, okay, we're raising the bar, it's not just great, it's like the very cream of the crop of the great vocalists. I mean, Axl Rose, Freddie Mercury, Robert Plant, uh, Brad Delp. I mean, he is up there. He, he can hit notes that most really good singers could never dream of hitting. So, so that's how good this song was. All right. And again, it was embraced by everybody. I think a lot of people who didn't really think of themselves as rock and rollers heard this yeah. song and, and loved it right away. OK, so before I go any further, you tell me, when did you first come into contact or whatever? I think uh, uh, my sophomore year, um, we went to see a Kinks concert. And on the way back, we were listening to classic rock for the uh, Sunrise Music Theater. And my friend Tim Quinlan was in the car and this Boston has, and, and so he had an interesting take and we could talk about the history and how Boston was formed, but he says, basic Boston is basically one guy's band. Tom and Schultz. Uh, these other guys are studio musicians who are brought in to work on this album, the album, the project. And I think it, to him at first, I don't know all that claim, no, no, but at first it was just this project. Yeah. Right. Okay, I think that description is largely true. I read a little bit on him. Okay, make no mistake about it. This guy was a genius, Tom Schultz. He he has yeah. a master's degree from MIT in engineering. Yes. Yep. And but the the players themselves were all from the area and they yeah, all yeah. kind of knew each other through session work and through smaller bands they had played together. So um, while I don't disagree that this was his baby, make no mistake about it. It was his, it was his idea, he, his concept, and he built a recording studio right there in his own basement in his home. Yeah. So he didn't have to waste millions of dollars in the recording studios because he could do it right there at home. And he could experiment with different sounds, different techniques, different gadgetry. I mean, he was a, he was a really brainy guy. Uh, so yeah, he it was his project, but I don't want to be dismissive of the other guy. No, 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 that, that wasn't my point. Was like, okay, okay. Look, if I'm doing a project and I want to make a, I'm going to bring in the best players, singers on earth right. if I can. Right? right? You have to set your ego aside and say, look, this is not going to work if if I have Paul Fields singing, I'm the worst singer on earth. Not going to work. But uh, I'm worse than you. Okay. Oh, oh man. <laughs> so 
um, if you read the album cover, it talks about that. But if you if you break down, I don't know if you want to go into this right now, but how he engineered the album, that album is engineered like a classic Mozart album. Yes. Because yes. The, everything is this way. Instead of a lot of rock is ba -ba 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 -ba. right, and it's like more than a feel, and it's and the way it's engineered, and that's why that's why you said exactly right. Girls are like, oh, I like this, right? It not that doesn't have the ripping, shredding lead guitar. Yes, <laughs> yes. yes. I didn't have the guy I didn't going, do a great job of articulating that, but no, you yes, know, but what you just and said. the secret doesn't go. I want to have sex with you, baby. Yes, and he's like, if I see my Marianne, well, it's it's a melancholy song. Yes, yes. And so that, that's not by accident. That's how I designed it. I, I, I believe every word of that. So, yes, the rock universe embraced it. But girls loved it. People who weren't even really into rock loved it. Man, yeah. this thing just was hitting on all cylinders. And, and it spread like wildfire. And it, it, it entered the charts. I pulled this up here just so I would have it. It entered the charts, uh, top 40 charts, on October 16th of 1976. And oh it God. reached <laughs> number five on the charts, uh, stayed on the charts for 14 weeks okay so it, it oh, was the song or the album the song the song okay because okay. i'm gonna get further into the album now yeah, i know I just but, but if you are that band and you release your album and the lead single achieves the kind of success that this single did there's nothing more you could possibly want and because of the success of the single the album sold like wildfire and, you know, we've made these jokes before about age tracks. So for those of you who are not old enough to appreciate <laughs> the 8-track so tape, the rectangular 8-track tape from the 70s, that's what we listened to back in those days. And the great thing about it was if you spent a lot of time in the car with your buddies, like me, uh, the 8-track played continuously. It just played. You never had to stop and flip it or lift the needle. It just played continuously. So... Hey. Um, Go ahead. Give me 20 seconds. Keep talking. I got something in my eye. I'm okay, right take care of that. Okay. Um, so anyway, I was, um, I was, I, I guess I should say, fortunate enough to be exposed to the entire album pretty much from day one because my best friend, a guy named John, who drove a Mustang with an A-track player, uh, he had the Boston album on a track and would play we'd get in the car and drive anywhere and everywhere and just play this album and so one of the first things you notice after you've played it through a few times is wow there are no weak tracks on this album not only are there no weak tracks every track on there potentially could have been released as a single that's that's how good the songs are because we all know that there has over over the years there have been a trend in which you release an album with one good song and nine filler songs just to sell records, but this was not one of those. So the album was a smash. Uh, it probably went to number one on the charts, I would assume. I also know that it is considered uh, one of the greatest um, debut albums. It sold like seventeen million or something like that. One of the highest selling debut albums uh, of all time, perhaps the highest. So um, what I'd be interested ahead. in finding out, and I should have done this. I just had to work like you had to work is when did they start touring? Like Oh, I can tell you that. Right. I, Cause I, I, I read up a little bit on them today. So when the, at the time the album was released, they were playing as a warm up band to several others like heart. I forget now who the, uh, they named them who they were, but within before the end was over, uh, before the year, before the end of the year had arrived. So say either November or December, they had switched and gone as the um, headliner. Headliner, exactly. So that's how fast they rose in stature based upon more than a feeling and this wonderful, fantastic debut album. Okay. Now, um, I'm not going to go through every song on the album. I'm just going to tell you which one's charted the second single was long time which on the album is it's a two-part song the intro portion Whoa. which is all instrumental is called foreplay and it leads into the song long time and 
in my opinion, you should not listen to one without the other. The two go together. It's an injustice to play long time without the instrumental intro uh, called foreplay. The third single, and that was released in February of 77. And the third single, Peace of Mind, was released in June of 77. And that went to number 38 on the charts. Didn't chart as high. I want to pay special noteworthiness to... The final track on the album, which is titled, Let Me Take You Home Tonight. Okay? And here's why. First of all, we talked about girls liking Boston. This is kind of a chick song, okay, lyrically. And again, Brad Delp is such a magnificent vocalist that I think anybody's going to like it. But he delivers it so well. So the song starts out kind of soft. It's a, it starts out ballady a little bit. Yep. A little bit ballady, but then transitions into a rocker. And as it's ending, it's really ramping up and rocking, you know? So we can't call it a power ballad. We'll just say that it starts off a little ballady before it picks up the pace, okay? But it's it's a great song, and it's a, it's a really good album ender, a finisher, a closer. Put it like that. So uh, – I can't say enough good things about this album. Easily one of the best albums I've ever listened to in my life. Yeah, it it uh when you go back and you listen to other like Steve Steve gets mad at me, you see him get mad at me when I say if you compare how that was in engineered and sounded versus a Led Zeppelin album, it, it's, the way that Shoals did it, like I, I just, it's so frustrating. How how it sounds so much better, and not just Led Zeppelin, who I worship, as you know, right. but every other band. And you're like, why does this album just just the sound of it? Yeah. Until I started getting into classical music, like in college and after, yeah. and then I realized this guy is a bloody genius. He, he is. Yeah, he is. Make no mistake and, about uh, it. Yeah. It, and it's like it's like what these some of the albums back then. I, I haven't haven't experienced this in twenty. Uh. Like you go put that album on, and you go. You got forty minutes of peace and serenity in your mind. You put on that Boston album, and you're like, okay, I can drive for another thirty miles, forty yeah. miles. I'm yeah. happy, or you know, yeah. I, I don't know how to explain it. Yeah, no, I agree. So, so this was all between seventy six and seventy seven, and as that was now fading from charts, I think. Everybody was thinking the same thing, and that is, okay, when's the next Boston album? Right. Because, man, don't keep us waiting, whatever you do. So in the fall, probably around August or September of 78, they released the follow-up album titled Don't Look Back. I can tell you, I, was, I had just graduated from high school. I was a freshman in college. I didn't have a stereo or anything. I had one of those dinky little tape recorders that you use to record lectures. And I went and bought the cassette tape. Yeah. The transition to cassette was just starting. I bought the cassette tape for like five bucks and played it. Of course, I had to take it out and flip it from one side to the other, but played it. And I thought this was really good. If we're going to use the 10 scale and call the first album a 10, and it was, this album was an 8.5 to a 9. It was that good, but just not quite as good as the first one. Go ahead. I I did not. There's that one hit on it. Uh, Forgot the name of the song now. It's embarrassing. Don't look back. Yeah, yeah. But the the album, I just, it didn't, I don't know, you know, maybe their expectations were too high. Their first album was too good. It just didn't blow me away. Okay, fair enough. And, you know, it. And like Eddie Trunk, this guy on that, you know, he's a guy the show. He says, look, the bands have their whole life to work on that first album. Right. And then you see where the real talent of the band is. Agreed. Going forward, right? Agreed. Well, and, go ahead. Well, here, I'll say it like this. I think the songs themselves, you know, I, mean, I mean, I know that somebody has to sit down and write those songs. The songs themselves are not as good, but the production is so good. The playing is so good. The vocals are so good that the final product is still a really great album, but it's not as good as the first one, okay? The lead single, Don't Look Back, which was the title track, it, and it's a, it's a good song, and it went to, uh, I'll tell you right now, it went to number four uh, on the top 40 charts, but it was not as good. This is just my opinion. The song is not as good as any of the songs on the first album, but it's still a good song. 
but it's not as good as any of the songs from the first album, okay? The song that I want to take a moment to recognize, though, is once again the final track on the album, and it's titled A Man I'll Never Be, all right? This song, in my opinion, is the prototype power ballad, okay? Brad Delp, oh my God, his vocals are so good on this thing. Again, soaring. Um, it starts out soft, a kind of song that girls would like, but then it has those those power notes through there, the guitar playing, you know, Tom Schultz, amazing guitarist, uh, wonderful production. And it ended up charting, even though it didn't go really high, it went to uh, number 31, and that would have been sort of at the end of 78, beginning of 79. Yeah, uh, right. But once you've heard it, you recognize that it's Boston, and it's a really good song, okay? So, again, it sold millions, didn't, didn't sell quite as well as the first one, but I think that most of the Boston fandom out there considered it to be a worthy follow-up. Okay, not as good as the first, but bought it and appreciated what they got. Okay, now here's where we run into all of the legal problems. I tried to read and get a handle on this legal mess that then ensued, and it is way too complicated to even try to explain. It was there were legal problems between the band and the record company, there were legal problems between the band members themselves. There were legal problems between one of the former managers who thought he was entitled to some cut of all of the future profits. It, it was such a mess, and they could not do anything because of the, the legal obstacles. So Tom Schultz basically told the members of the band, if you guys want to go do any kind of a solo thing or whatever, go ahead, because we're, st we're stuck in quicksand right now. We can't do anything. I think that this destroyed the career of Boston. It destroyed what could have been. Barry Goudreau, who was a guitarist, recorded an album uh, called Barry Goudreau, and I think all of the members of Boston played on the album, and the single from the album titled Dreams. If you've never heard it, type it into YouTube, Barry Goudreau, Dreams. It sounds just like a Boston song, and Brad Delp does the vocal. So you, the first thing you're going to say is, wow, why don't they just call it Boston? Uh, of course, the album as a whole wasn't great, but that, I think that song is a very good song. So um, several years went by. The contract thing is still a mess, and they can't record. So Barry Goudreau then forms a band called Orion the Hunter. And this was in the early days of MTV. So they got a lot of play with a song called So You Ran. So if you don't remember that one, type in Orion the Hunter, So You Ran on YouTube. It'll come up, and the first thing you'll go is, oh, I remember that song. And it does sound like Boston. Didn't, didn't think of it, but it does sound like Boston. Okay. So the years are still ticking, ticking by, and finally 1986 rolls around. And Boston finally, eight years later, finally releases their third album titled Third Stage. Now, I want to be as fair as I can be about this. The album sold well, and it went straight to number one on the album charts. I believe there were literally millions of people like me who had been waiting and waiting and waiting. And like for me, I had already determined when that album finally comes out, I don't need to hear it first. I'm going to buy it the day it hits the stores. That's how bad I want to get the next Boston album. Okay, And I did. I bought it the day it hit the stores. The single that was released, which did go to number one, was Amanda. Now, I can't speak for anybody else out there. I didn't. I did not hate the song, but it was such a. It lowered the bar so far from what they had the, the standard that they had established with those first two albums. For me, this song was so not worthy of what they had done prior. It, it just failed to meet expectations. Now, it sold millions. It was all over radio. They made tons of money off of it. So you could say, ah, oh, they're laughing all the way to the bank. But I felt like, when I heard the song, I felt like Boston is over. Okay, 
go ahead. No, I agree. And at, it's a weird thing, you know, um, making music and movies and, and whatever is, is a very bizarre, what you'd call a non-linear process. And if, if you just, anybody that's watching this show, you've heard stories about Jimmy Page. Well, I, I was walking in the market one day and I saw this thing and I said, do, do, do. And I, and I got the riff for the song, you know, and I showed Robert. So, right. And so like, and this is how this leads to the phenomenon of, remember uh, my, uh, part-time lover by Stevie Wonder. He, he had supposedly he got sued for lifting that song and because another guy wrote it and maybe he heard it. And then... There is a riff that from that song, that riff that's been used in a hundred or more other songs. Yeah. So, yeah. Yeah, so it's... And I hate when people say this. Every riff's been, already been written. That's a lie. I agree. People, people who... um because every time I hear something new that I've never heard before, I'm like, oh, wow, that's that's a new riff or that's right. a new thing, you know. Right. But uh, yeah, so so my whole while I'm on this diatribe or going off on tangent, all those years you would have figured that Boston would have had. Let's get let's get four albums like. I physical, agree. A physical graffiti. There was only like six or seven songs that was made for that album. The other songs were were made for earlier albums they had just brought forward. Right. And they made a double album out of it. Right. Right. So you'd figure they'd have some stuff on, you know, and and, uh, and maybe Barry Goudreau, like you said, like, screw that. I'm going to go make my own money. And right. But yeah. they didn't have anything online. So they came up with this Amanda and they probably knew it would sell a lot of copies. Right. You know, they went the REO Speedwagon route. Right. It felt to me like they saw, they said, okay, Foreigner sold millions with ballads. So did REO Speedwagon. So did Sticks. Let's do a ballad. I, I I don't know. Maybe I'm wrong, but that's what it felt like. The production was still wonderful, but the songs themselves, you know, I saw a discussion one time online where these guys were disagreeing over what makes a rock song versus a non-rock song. And and two guys, one guy said, if the song has to have balls. It has to have testosterone. Yeah. And if it doesn't, it's not a rock song. And these Boston songs, they didn't have testosterone. They didn't, you know? You can listen to them and go, okay, they're they're well played and he sings great. But these songs have no testosterone at all. They just sound like pop songs that have been jazzed up and rockified to make them sound like rock songs, but they're not really rock songs. That was my take on it. Yeah, I mean, what proves you right is you know, a lot of bands have their down album after a good or, you know, and then they come back. Like Led Zeppelin, we've said this a hundred times, Led Zeppelin 3 was considered a down album, although I think it's a masterpiece. And they came back with Led Zeppelin 4. Boston came back with nothing, right? right. So you figure they, they know the string is out. And, you know, and Tom Scholes, you know, I think he was getting into politics at that point and getting Come older. Back. And, yeah. you know, that's the hard thing about, music is you got to have that edge that that motivation you know right. if you're aerosmith and you've had you sold 300 million cop whatever all right time to make an album steven tyler's like yeah right <laughs> i want right. to get on my jet and have girl you know what i'm saying like right you got to have that motivation you right. know i agree i agree and so and boston went on to record another album in the 90s around 94 yeah um can't remember the name of it i bought it i bought it i was staying true uh, to to the band but it was again it was weak the the songs didn't really rock they were kind of middle of the road and they were they were just average songs didn't sell well and did not chart any singles so i'm not surprised um i want to mention real quick we got our warning a second ago so we'll go a few more minutes here wrap it up i want to mention real quick that the song more than a feeling the the main riff in that song was borrowed from the song tend my garden by the james gang and i did mention this on a previous episode but and i'm not i'm not saying this to accuse boston of plagiarism or anything like that i mean they heard the riff and said oh my gosh i love it let's put it at one of our songs nothing wrong with that the two songs do not sound alike there's that one single riff in there that you go oh i hear it i hear it okay interestingly though tom schultz in an interview said that the song that he used as the model for more than a feeling was a song from the 60s called walk away renee do you know that song i'm not sure okay if you heard it you'd go oh my god i've heard this a million times trust me but it's a 60s song the band was called the left bank b-a-n-k-e i assume that they were british but they're not they're from chicago <laughs> anyway um 
it goes kind of like this. I'm not going to sing it, but the verses themselves are very soft. And then it transitions into the soaring chorus, you know, don't walk away. No, just walk away. Just walk away, Renee. Oh, I know that song. Yeah, I know you've heard it. You've heard it. Everybody's heard it. Okay. It's a, it's a good song. It's a it, good song. I like that song. It really is. But he was modeling more than a feeling after just walk away, Renee. And I go, oh, okay. I see it. I, I get it. And, and I think that's a, if you're going to choose a song to model, I think that was a good one to do it. So, so uh, I, I thought that was interesting. Uh, anyway, to wrap up on Boston before we uh, uh, get out of here, Brad Delp, back in 2007, took his own life. He was 55 years old. Oh. I remember hearing it in the news and was saddened by it. You know, of course, I didn't know him. We weren't friends. We didn't hang out or whatever. But he had made such an immeasurable contribution to my youth, my formative years. Not just, I mean, not just to the rock universe, but it felt personal to me. And um, I have no idea what kind of demons the guy had. But um, when I first heard that he had passed away, I didn't, there was no cause of death. I subsequently learned it was suicide. He put two gas grills in his bathroom and turned the gas on to, to kill himself. Um, so, um, so anyway, it's very saddened by that. Very I don't sad. know what the rest of these guys uh, may be doing these days. I hope that they're all well. I, you know, who knows? Uh, but anyway, do you have any final thoughts, well, any closing comments? I don't know if people, it's funny because I saw this band. You don't, I, you probably don't know who they're called. Helmet, heavy, I've heavy. Heard of them. Yeah. They're not dark. They're very smart guys. Okay. And they played the other night. And after they got done playing, me and my buddy Aaron uh, and his girlfriend, we walked up and they just came out into the on, at the security fence and they started hugging and I was telling him about a, a day I had a crappy day at Yellowstone with Steve okay and uh and my wife anyway and uh I said okay I gotta get out of this crappy foul mood so I put in a helmet and I and I told him I told the drummer the story two nights ago and he's like really I'm like yeah you guys got me out of this crappy poopy day because I had your music with me and I put that as a this and it sure enough boom, boom. so um, and they were appreciative and they, you know, like, cause they're my, they're our age. Helmet's gotta be my age or older. So, um, so one time I was in, uh, uh the islands in, uh, post Sam we an island off of Thailand. And I was in this hotel room. Well, it's not a hotel room, a room, no air conditioning. It was a hundred degrees. And the woman I was with was really sick and it was covered in sweat. We had the fan blowing and I said, I got to go to bed. So I put on Boston's first album on my, and, and I just slowly drifted off for about an hour. And when the album went up, I kind of went back. I'm like, oh, no, I'm still in hell. <laughs> it was still so hot. And I was like, man, Boston really got me. And so what I'm trying to say is if the band hears, they should hear these stories, how you're helping people. Right. Like Kurt Cobain, all these people that he helped. And it's all oh, about the only one with these problems. Right. right. And so he blew his head off, you know, for, you know. yeah. So yeah. It, it's, I don't know. Like, yeah, I don't know what his demons were, but like yeah. you said you need help people and you got you got the human, Dude, the you, I, human my experience. teenage years you have yeah. no idea the role you played in my teenage yes. years yeah that's my whole point it's like yeah and I'm, you know you could say hey look my life's crap but i'm helping all these other people that's cool you know yeah yeah uh okay one quick little anecdote i know you'll get a kick out of this Back in the 70s, hitchhiking was common. You know, I hitchhiked a million times before Very I ever had so. a car. And I, because people always picked me up, I would pick up hitchhikers generally. So one day, this would have been 1979, I had, I was in the car by myself and I had a cassette, Boston, <laughs> more than a feeling was playing. And there was some black dude walking along Palm Beach Lakes Boulevard hitchhiking. So I pulled over to give him a ride. Um, I was getting on I-95 in probably a mile. So I wasn't going to be able to take him real far, but, but he got in and I said, I can probably only take you up to the uh, uh, interstate there. He said, that's fine. And as we're driving and the song's playing, he looks over and he goes, I really love that song. <laughs> and I go, it's great. You know, more than a feeling. I told you, everybody loved it. Everybody loved it. Um, yeah, anyway, it's like a, a sign. Like he, he knew, okay, this day might be better than I thought with, uh, with Boston coming on. Right. Right. Uh, okay. So listen, we're going to go ahead and wrap it up there, but, if you're watching, please like, comment, and subscribe. And and really, I really appreciate the comments. I mean, people have made some 
I, I mean, the comments, they, they make it so worthwhile doing these videos because I feel like we're interacting, you know, especially yeah. when we when we neglect to mention things and then people add those to the comments. Yeah, that please, makes it so please correct us. Please yeah, correct yeah, us. <laughs> yeah, by all means. But uh, yeah, please like, comment, and subscribe. We will love you for that. Okay, we're going to wrap it up. Uh, this is the great classic rock debate. I am Kenny. I am Paul. Yes, and um, until we meet again, we'll see you next time.